Today we will be going over radiographic interpretation of dental caries. So as we already know, dental radiographs are a critical component of comprehensive care. It is important for the dental hygienist to be skilled in interpreting radiographs for things like deviations of normal, such as lesions or diseases, that would otherwise not be identified clinically. Examples of these lesions or diseases include caries, periapical pathosis, bone loss, subgingival calculus, fractures of the tooth or jaw, resorption, and much more. Although as hygienists we are not allowed to make diagnoses, we need to be able to properly refer abnormal areas to the dentist for diagnosis purposes. So you should be able to look at the radiographs you're taking, see something that appears abnormal, and be able to say that to the dentist, I would like you to look at tooth number 30 to assess X, Y, or Z. One important infection you must be able to identify in a radiograph is dental caries. Dental caries appear as radiolucent areas seen in the various tissues within the tooth. Now it is important to, to note that at least 30 to 50% of the tooth structure must be demineralized before caries are apparent on a radiograph. This is why caries are generally larger clinically than radiographically. Now this is important to know because when you see something that may appear small in a radiograph, you need to know that it is bigger than it actually appears to be, so it's probably bigger than you think. You should also note that a carious lesion can take three to four years to appear radiographically, therefore it is definitely important to monitor a patient's oral health status very carefully. So if you're looking for intraproximal caries, we will most commonly be using the bite wing radiograph. So interproximal caries are caries that are typically found between two or more teeth and can only be diagnosed typically through radiographs. Typically, interproximal decay is seen at or below the contact points of the teeth. The shape that caries will take on is more of a triangular configuration in the enamel with a point at the triangle pointing towards the DEJ. Once caries reaches the dentin, as another triangle is created, a new triangle will appear from the DEJ that is facing or spreading towards the pulp chamber in all directions. So when I look at this radiograph, I'm looking now for interproximal decay. So how should I be looking for this? So the easiest way to do that is to simply trace the tooth from CEJ to CEJ focusing on the radio opacity of the enamel and seeing if there's any areas that you see any variation. So here on this radiograph, let's start here at tooth number three. So if I trace tooth number, th tooth number three, I can already see here, I've got an MOD, so M, mesial, O, occlusal, D, distal amalgam here. So I have a restoration here on tooth number three. But now let's see what happens when I come to tooth number four. So if it's, I trace tooth number four from CEJ to CEJ, oh, here I have this radiolucent area on the distal of the tooth. So as I trace this, I found what appears to me like a radiolucency, so possibly interproximal decay. And I come around, I don't see anything else. So that's how you're going to be interpreting dental radiographs for caries. That's the best way to do it in order to make sure you don't miss anything. Now before we continue to move on, it's also important to note that you can also utilize periapicals to interpret interproximal decay if you're working in the anterior region. So with anterior teeth, you also need to remember you don't necessarily need to use a radiograph. You can use transillumination, which you've been utilizing in clinic, in order to determine if there is decay present in the anterior of the tooth. Radiography might be needed for patients who have multiple restorations in the anterior, or if you're just checking to see what the severity of the infection may be. There is also such a thing as an anterior bite wing. However, it is not as effective to diagnose anterior interproximal caries due to the geometry of the maxillary arch, so they are not typically used. So moving right along, you've already learned about the GV black classifications of caries, but GV blacks is more talking about caries interpreting for restorations. 
Classification of interproximal caries is something completely different. So there's five classifications here that are completely separate from what you learned in GB Blacks. So make sure you separate these two in your mind. The five categories for classification of interproximal caries include class one, which is incipient, class two, which is moderate, class three, which is advanced, class four, which is severe, and class five, which is root caries. So to start, we'll start with incipient. So incipient, or class one, includes caries that extends less than halfway through the enamel. So caries that extends less than halfway through the enamel is significant because at that point it can be arrested or reversed with proper, proper treatment. So remember, proper treatment can include things like better oral hygiene, such as flossing daily, or fluoride treatments using a higher fluoride toothpaste. So let's look at this radiograph and see if we can find any incipient decay. So if we start here, I'm going to trace from CEJ to CEJ on tooth number two. When I come here, it's difficult to diagnose what's going on between tooth numbers two and three because I have a little bit of overlap here. As I come along tooth number three, I have an occlusal amalgam. And I can tell this is an amalgam because it's very radiopaque with ragged borders. We'll go over this in a later lecture. And as I come back and around, go back to my next CEJ, I don't see anything of concern here. Tooth number four, I trace from CEJ to CEJ. I don't see anything of concern here. I come down here now to tooth number 28. There is this kind of jagged area here, but that's not decay. It's just some sort of anomaly. Come along down around my enamel. I do have this little radiopaque bump here, but that's actually just calculus. I come to tooth number 29. I'm going to trace from CEJ to CEJ, and when I come around to the distal, I see this radiolucent triangular area forming here that is less than halfway through the enamel. Thus, I know that it's incipient. And then I look at tooth number 30 here. I don't see any decay. I do, however, see this little bump here. This is calculus. So another important thing to determine, so we've determined where our class one incipient decay is, but we also should be thinking, why did this patient get this decay? And if I'm seeing calculus between multiple teeth, along with that incipient carious lesion, I should probably be instructing my patient that they need to floss better. So this is where your oral hygiene instruction will come in handy. So I want to make this patient specific. This patient definitely needs to be flossing because they have subgingival calculus as well as incipient decay. Next we'll move on to moderate. So class 2 is moderate. Class 2 extends more than halfway through the enamel but does not involve the DEJ. So it does not involve the dentin enamel junction. So when I look at my radiograph here, I'm going to start here at tooth number 12. Now tooth number 12, when I come along here, I definitely see a very large radiolucent area. So can you see there's a smaller triangle through the enamel and then it, it branches off again through the dentin? This is much more than moderate. So I definitely have caries here on tooth number 12. I move along to tooth number 13. I definitely here have a very large amalgam restoration, so I have it on the mesial and occlusal and distal, so I have an MOD amalgam here. Tooth number 14 here, I see calculus on the mesial surface, and as I come around from CEJ to CEJ, I have a large MO amalgam. I know it's only MO because I do not see any amalgam on the distal surface here. This restoration is large, so it also could extend either onto the buccal or lingual surfaces of the tooth. However, obviously I wouldn't be able to see that because I'm looking at a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional image. So that's something I'd have to assess for um, clinically. And then as I come along to the distal of that tooth, there's a little bit of overlap here. I move on to tooth number 15. I have an occlusal amalgam. I move right along. Coming on to the mandible, tooth number 18, I have some overlap on the distal, an occlusal amalgam, and I come along to the mesial, again, a little bit of overlap here, so it makes it difficult for diagnosis. Tooth number 19, I come along CEJ to CEJ, again, another occlusal amalgam, and I come around, I can see some calculus here, on the mesial surface of this tooth. And now here I am on tooth number 20, and as I start to trace it around, I see here this radiolucent triangle that extends more than halfway through the enamel. So 
here on tooth number 20 on the distal here, the distal of tooth number 20 is going to be moderate decay. Next we have advanced, so advanced or class 3 is caries that extends through the DEJ and into the dentin, but does not extend through the dentin more than halfway to the pulp. So here again, we'll assess this radiograph for decay. So let's start at tooth number 13. So I'm going to trace tooth number 13 from CEJ to CEJ. I come around and I definitely see some radiolucent triangles between the contacts of number 13 and 14. So when I look at this, it appears here that I have this radiolucent area that is more than halfway through the enamel. So I would classify the distal of number 13 as class 2. And when I look at tooth number 14, I see a very small radiolucent area. So I would classify that as class 1. I come along again. Here again I have an occlusal amalgam. And onto the distal of 14, I have some overlap here, so it's difficult to diagnose between 14 and 15. Then I trace from CEJ to CEJ on tooth number 15 with an occlusal amalgam. Now I'll come along to the mandible. When I look here at tooth number 18, I have an occlusal amalgam. And here, tooth number 19, I definitely have some interproximal decay. So when I look here, I have this black triangle that extends all the way through the enamel, through the DEJ, and I can see this radiolucent area in the dentin as well. It hasn't progressed further than past halfway through the dentin, so I know that this is going to be class 3 or advanced decay. And then I can see I have an amalgam, and I can also see I have some interproximal decay as well on tooth number 20. Next I have class 4 or severe decay. So class 4 is extending through the enamel and dentin and more than halfway to the pulp. So here I'm going to assess my radiograph again. So tooth number 2, I have an MO amalgam. Tooth number 3, I have a very large MOD amalgam. So look at this amalgam here. It's so large and we also have an overhang here that when I look at the distal of tooth number four, I have this radiolucent area here. You can see it's a bit hazy, but you can definitely assume that the decay that has started here on tooth number four has something to do with the large overhang that's most likely causing food impaction on tooth number three. If we move down to the mandible, here on tooth number 30, I have an MO amalgam, and I come around, and then I have this large carious lesion on the distal here. So I can see I'm through the enamel, and I am definitely more than halfway through the dentin. Now what's important to note about this is that you can see there's some darker radiolucency and then there's still some radiolucency moving out. Remember that we said that you can see in a radiograph less than, you can, than what it actually looks like clinically. So we know that even though this may look close to the pulp but not all the way through the pulp, this, this lesion might actually be to the pulp. So this patient may actually need a root canal. So this is definitely something you would want to bring to the attention of the dentist when you take a radiograph like this, because if the infection has gotten into the pulp, this patient may have an infection that needs a root canal. And next we have class 5, or root caries. So root caries are more going to be more common in elderly patients. Often, this type of caries you can see clinically, and it is found just apical to the CEJ. Root caries is going to appear like a crater on a radiograph, so it'll be very distinct. Almost looks like you took an ice cream scoop to the tooth and scooped out a portion of the tooth, so it will be very distinct. Often, when you have root caries, it will be associated with periodontal disease, so you'll see this on areas with recession or with bone destruction. So here on this radiograph, you can see we have here root caries, so you can see it's very distinct scooped out area on the tooth. And then when I look at this radiograph, it looks like this patient has definitely had root caries in the past. We have this class 5 restoration existing up here. So we can also determine if a patient has buccal or lingual caries. However, it's better to detect them with a clinical exam 
it's very difficult to see them on a radiograph. It's going to appear more small as a round radiolucent area with well-defined margins. But a ledin must be more advanced in order to actually appear on a radiograph clearly. The other reason it's better to determine them clinically is because there's no way to tell if a lesion is buccal or lingual on a radiograph because radiographs are two-dimensional of a three-dimensional object. Sometimes, however, if you do see a radiolucency, you can make a guess as to where you think it is based on the patient's anatomy. So on this image here, you see there's this radiolucent, well-defined area here on tooth number 31. Well, we know that our mandibular molars have buccal grooves, so we can probably assume that this decay is probably on the buccal surface, but we would need to assess it clinically just, just to be sure. So next we'll be going over occlusal caries. So radiographic, radiographically, we can also identify caries involving the chewing surface, pits, pits and fissures, along with the interproximal. Pits and fissures are inherently more susceptible to caries due to their inability to self-cleanse. Now it's important to know that early occlusal caries are not going to be able to be detected radiographically due to, due to the superimposition of healthy enamel and dental tissues. Thus, you can often diagnose occlusal caries through clinical examination. So, clin so clinical examination means your shepherd's hook. So most often you're going to be checking for occlusal caries with your shepherd's hook, which you've already done in your clinical classes. Occlusal caries cannot be identified on a radiograph until it has reached the DEJ and is progressing into the dentin. So occlusal caries can be classified in three different ways. So you can classify it as incipient, moderate, or severe. Like we said, in the case of an incipient caries, the lesion cannot be detected with a dental radiograph. However, with moderate caries on the occlusal, the caries lesion extends into the dentin and appears as a thin radiolucent line between the enamel and the dentin. So now I look at my picture here. When I look at tooth numbers two and three, I can see this radiolucent band just under the enamel here. So I can see there's a radiolucency here. And then I can see it again on tooth number 30, just this radiolucent area. So that's going to be how moderate occlusal caries is going to appear radiographically. You can also have severe occlusal decay. So severe occlusal decay will be a caries lesion that extends into the dentin and appears as a large radiolucency extending under the occlusal surface of the tooth. Once caries has progressed significantly, the enamel is undermined and can collapse. So here we see a very large, severe occlusal caries. So another way you can classify caries is as recurrent or secondary caries. So recurrent caries is another type that you can find radiographically. This occurs adjacent to or under an existing restoration. So a carious lesion on the proximal and occlusal margins of restorations are easier to identify with radiographs because it'll be easier to see underneath those, those restorations with the x-ray. So they're going to appear as a radiolucent area just beneath the margins. So here I can see recurrent caries present on tooth number 29. So I have my MO amalgam and then I have this radiolucent area underneath it. So that's going to be our recurrent caries. We can also have rampant caries. So rampant caries refers to sudden, rapid, and uncontrollable destruction of the teeth. Most often this is observed with primary teeth of young children or permanent teeth of teenagers or adults with xerostomia. So advanced and severe caries is often what you see with rampant caries and it's going to affect multiple teeth. So in this radiograph here you can see there's fairly advanced or severe decay on almost every tooth. So that's rampant caries. Now this is another important thing for everyone to remember because I unfortunately can promise that everyone here will make this mistake at one point. It's important to know that some radiolucent haziness at the CEJ is not always decay. However, instead, it's termed cervical burnout. Cervical burnout is a result of excessive x-ray penetration of an object or part of an object producing an overexposed area on the radiograph. So here we can see there's a little bit of a radiolucency right underneath the CEJ here, but this isn't going to be root caries. This is cervical burnout. Remember that root caries is almost appears like an ice cream scoop. It's very distinct. If you have to think about it and you're not sure, 
and you really have to look hard in order to see what you're looking at, it's very likely that it's cervical burnout. So if you're thinking root caries, you should be looking for a cupped or cratered shape below the CEJ. And if you're still not sure, looking clinically at the patient, you will definitely be able to, de to determine it. Cervical burnout, however, will have very ill-defined borders. It'll almost be a little bit wedge-shaped, located in the cervical region, but there will be no clinical appearance. So if you look at the patient clinically, you will not see anything. So now I just have some practice radiographs. So I want everyone on their own to try to go through these radiographs and determine what they think they are by themselves. This will be really good practice, not only for your exams and for lab, but also as you move on in clinic as well. When you start taking radiographs on real patients, you will need to be able to do this on your own. So let's look at this radiograph. For starters, what tooth number am I starting at here? Give yourself some time. Think about what tooth number that is. Well, I hope you thought it was tooth number 12. So I'm going to follow from CEJ to CEJ. So I can't really see the mesial surface of this tooth. But I'm going to come along onto the distal. And here on the distal, I have this area here. I see a small radiolucent triangle. It's pretty close to halfway through the enamel. So I'm going to call it class two because it's close. And again, as long as you can rationalize it, there will be times where these will be close and it will be difficult to determine which classification it is. But as long as you have a rational rationale and we can go through it together, you should be able to figure out the answer. Next, we'll move on to tooth number 13. So as I trace along this enamel, we definitely have a patient who is not flossing. So here on the mesial surface here, I definitely have some class two caries. So moderate caries on the mesial of tooth number 13. And then I come along to the distal of tooth number 13. And I have this triangular area here. So we have caries here on the distal of number 13. And this one's a little bit more tricky. So this one is pretty close to going all the way through and extending to the DEJ, but it's hard to tell. So I would classify this one as class two. But again, in this case, we could get the doctor and have him assess the area to make a diagnosis as to whether or not this was moderate or advanced. As I move on to tooth number 14, I have some radiolucency here. Come around the tooth and some overlap. So here would probably just be a class one, very small. Now, what's another thing that's important to note is that very often if a patient has caries on the distal surface of one tooth, it's likely that the adjacent tooth will have caries in the mesial. So very often you see caries on two adjacent teeth on the surfaces that are touching each other, which is why it is so important to be encouraging patients to floss because you can see how rapidly things can go bad. So as I come around, I've got a lot of overlap between 14 and 15, 15 and 16. As I come down, I can't really see tooth number 17. So I'll move on to tooth number 18. So here's a restoration that we have here. So tooth number 18 here has an MO composite restoration. I know that this is composite, not amalgam, because you can see that the lines, the borders are very kind of smooth. They're not jagged, and it's not quite as radiopaque as the, as the amalgams that we were looking at. I can also see here there's a little bit of a radiolucent area underneath the composite. Now I should not jump to conclusion and assume that this is recurrent decay underneath the composite because what you can sometimes find is a liner underneath the composite restorations. So in this case, I'd want to consult with the doctor and just have him take a look at this just to make sure that what I'm looking at is a liner and not recurrent decay. I'll then come around tooth number 19. Again, we have an occlusal composite here. We'll move on to tooth number 20. So tooth number 20 has a very large composite restoration here. What I also don't like about this composite is here, we're not necessarily looking at caries as much as we're looking at is poor margins. So the margins of this restoration are not flush with the tooth, which is going to allow bacteria to get underneath this restoration. This patient will most likely get recurrent decay. So this is definitely something that would need to be treated. You would definitely want to point this out to the doctor. And now we have tooth number 21. 
So tooth number 21, of all the teeth on this dental radiograph, this is the one that your eyes should immediately be going to. When I look at the distal of tooth number 21, I see a very large radiolucent area underneath what looks like a composite here. When I look at this, this is a very large area of decay. You can see it's almost all the way to the pulp, but we know with radiographs, we can't see as much as what it would appear clinically, so this might have extended into the pulp. This patient might be in pain, and this patient might need a root canal. So this is definitely where I want your eyes to be going first. And with this ne next radiograph, yes, it is definitely blurry, and you couldn't make an accurate diagnosis from this. But what I want you to see from this is not the restoration. I don't want you to be looking for all the radiopaque areas. I just want you to see the radiolucencies. So from this, your eyes should immediately see that there are two very large carious lesions. Does everyone see where those carious lesions are? The largest ones are 29 and 30. So I want you to immediately not worry about the blurriness, not worry about being able to identify exactly what you see, but when you take radiographs, your eyes should immediately be going to, ooh, I definitely think I see some infection here before you move any further. And the last radiograph we'll look at is this one here. So again, I want you practicing these on your own and making sure that you can do this by yourself. So here, we can't really see tooth number one, so we'll start with tooth number two. So if I only trace the enamel on tooth number two, I can see that I definitely have an occlusal amalgam, it might possibly extend onto the buccal or lingual surfaces. And as I come around, the enamel itself is completely intact. However, I have this radiolucent area within the dentin of the tooth, which leads me to believe that I may have some caries that is present on the buccal or lingual surface of the tooth or recurrent underneath this restoration. So I would definitely bring up to the dentist, I would like you to assess tooth number two for diagnosis of the radiolucent area under the amalgam on tooth number two. Tooth number three, I have a DO amalgam here. I have a little bit of overlap between tooth numbers three and four. As I follow the enamel here, I look pretty intact. The distal of five that I can see looks intact. I come along to the mandible. I have a lot of overlap, excessive overlap, that I cannot diagnose here between 28 and 29. When I look at tooth number 29, I have this DO restoration. This might not actually be an amalgam. This could be a gold foil. Because when you look at this, look how clean these margins are. So this might be an onlay or gold foil. We'd have to take a look at this in the mouth. And then we have tooth number 30. Tooth number 30 has class four severe decay. How do we know this? because we see here, we extend all the way through the enamel and halfway, possibly more than halfway through the dentin. And then I have my occlusal amalgam. I come along, a little bit of overlap, but no decay to the next CEJ. Move along to the CEJ tooth number 31. I come along, I have an amalgam on the occlusal, onto the distal and I don't see anything on the distal of tooth number 31. So that's everything for this lecture. This stuff is very important for you to know moving forward, so make sure you review this, and feel free to ask me any questions that you may have, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.